This rather crude time lapse, cropped out of the Atlas Project's 360 degree webcam on the Sutherland site, gives an overview of the construction of the building and dome of this very project, covered in much more detail in this video. To speed things up, time lapse footage was used extensively to cover the 11 day construction period, and where conditions permitted, drone footage was also taken, of which some was included here. A site visit with a selected contractor back in February 2020 to finalize the last details. Construction started three weeks later on Monday 16th of March and was very effectively completed within a week by Ayetu Alpha Civils from Worcester. They are no strangers to Sutherland, having completed a number of civil projects on site before. The pad and pier was actually quite simple, with the main requirement being level and dimensionally accurate. Here I yet to deliver excellently, which helped us tremendously to do the dome assembly, resulting in a building that fitted the pad like a glove. The pad was completed a week before COVID-19 lockdown kicked in. After being somewhat delayed due to the pandemic, the shipping container with the parts for the building and the dome was finally offloaded on its purpose-built pads in Sutherland on the 15th of October. Since it was decided that we will be doing the actual construction, we were familiarizing ourselves on all the available information, and three weeks later arranged a reconnaissance trip to Sutherland to check on the exact contents of the shipment to prevent any nasty surprises when construction was due to start two weeks later. We found the container very damp inside, with mold starting to grow on some of the wood, which were given some air. During the next two weeks, all the necessary tools and supplies were required and the construction process studied. When we arrived in Sutherland on Monday the 16th of November, we were as ready as could be. Unfortunately, the help from local technicians we enlisted did not materialize as envisaged. One person fell ill and another had responsibilities to attend to, which meant that Willie in the brown hat and Nick in the pink cap ended up doing about 75% of the work by ourselves. The first thing we had to do was to establish a proper north-south line to orientate the building accurately. For this we attempted to set up a plumb line to mark its shadow at local noon. However, wind prevented this, so we used a plank instead, strapped vertically to the pier. Unfortunately, thin cloud moved in by solar noon, but we did manage to get a north-south line with enough confidence to extend across the pad to work from. In order to see what the dome's door looks like, we needed it removed from the container first. For this, the help of the site's forklift was called in. Isn't it amazing how the simplest of tasks often end up causing the biggest hold-ups? First, the forklift needed to be jump-started due to a rundown battery before retrieving the crate. While at it, a second crate also needed to be removed. This was when disaster struck again. This time the forklift got stuck in soft sand, right down to its belly, requiring it to be pulled out. Luckily it can jack itself up on its forks to aid digging it out. The crate containing the dome cladding was quite heavy and was stored to one side until later. Since we knew there was a clash between the posts carrying the mezzanine floor and the initial envisaged position of the door, we had to orientate the bottom dome ring to cater for this. This is why you will still notice the ramp not lining up properly. It was subsequently widened. The positions of the posts were carefully measured out. After email confirmation overnight that we can proceed, the holes for bolting the bottom ring to the pad were marked out, drilled through the wood, and finally also into the concrete. Since these bolts are chemically anchored into the concrete, their holes needed to be cleaned out properly, using a blower fitted with a tube. By the way, the processions of cars you will see occasionally are visitors being escorted COVID-19 style. Two tubes of chemical anchoring was enough to secure the 24 bolts. Nick created a nifty sculpture from the leftovers, demonstrating the amazing strength of this stuff. In order to access the wood stored under the sled of dome parts, it had to be removed next, for which the forklift was again ideal. Since the sled is almost the length of the container, it had to be dragged out carefully. This was done in stages, providing a landing at every stage so that it does not fall or damage anything. The box containing the sensitive electrical equipment was removed to be stored under roof out of the weather. By day 3 we were finally ready to start erecting the wall studs. 
Since we are more familiar with South African building methods, including brick and mortar, we now had to learn how to do American-style wood frame construction, which were completely foreign to us. This involved things like toe nailing. Google it if you don't know what I'm talking about. The recommended procedure is to first erect all the studs by themselves, but this was not possible in Sutherland's windy conditions, which even blew over our ladders, so we had to adapt another strategy. This was not so easy for two people only, so we were up and down on ladders like a jack-in-a-box and employed long planks as helpers, which we named after the two guys who meant to help us. After getting one stud wrong and battled to remove it, we realized how strong toenailing is. After that incident, we shouted knots out as we toenailed every new stud down and we never made that mistake again. After first completing a skeleton structure which could stand by itself in the wind, we could go back and fill in the missing studs. By now, we got the hang of American construction and it went quite quickly. When a colleague came by to lend a hand, we realized the value of one more person to speed up progress. All studs except the ones around the door were installed by the end of the day. On day four, we tackled the door. This wasted an amazing amount of time to figure out exactly what to do and was aggravated even more while searching for the mounting bolts. An email to the supplier eventually determined that the bolts were left out from our kit. The problem is that they cannot be easily fitted afterwards once the building is finished, so we had to improvise again. After plumbing the building, which is still somewhat wobbly at this stage, we mounted the strip going through the notches. From the air, the three props that keep the building plumb can be seen. A convenient opening through which Nick escapes here is where one of the posts will eventually go. Next up was nailing down the plywood. Ironically, because of the perpetual wind in Sutherland, we only unpacked the container as we progressed. The plywood were in two piles, each at the bottom of a heap. It so happened that we started at the wrong heap, since only when reaching the second heap did we discover pre-cut sheets for use at the door where the spacing is non-standard. This would have saved us from cutting sheets, but luckily there were enough extras for this. As can be seen on the trestles on the left, we discovered by chance that one can easily pre-bend the plywood by adding some weight to the overhanging ends. We therefore stored the sheets overnight, bent over some planks, which was a great help the next day. Installing the top layer of the plywood was scheduled for day 5. As can be seen from the site weather record, the wind was again a factor to reckon with, particularly when handling plywood sheets. The camera shake due to wind can be seen here, and my hat blew off at one stage. Luckily as the wind picked up, we were working our way around the dome, where it actually helped us, coming from behind. At times we had to wait for lulls in the wind to quickly dash across with the neck sheet. From this angle, the flapping of the tied up door gives an indication of the wind. Even though the camera was deliberately placed in the wind shadow of the neighboring dome, some shake is still visible. As we worked our way around, it got more difficult again. While Nick was away for a meeting in the afternoon, I finished off the bit above the door. Another piece we could not find in the kit was a rain shelter that must go above the door. Right at the end we think we found one, but since we only have a crude sketch of it, it's hard to verify. Day 6 was a Sunday, so only Nick and myself again. This was a nice calm day to first finish off the plywood, before tackling the sheet steel cladding. Some weatherproofing was still required around the door frame, which is what Nick is busy doing here. The dome looked quite fancy in its wooden underwear. After opening the crate, we determined that there are enough spare sheets to select the best unscratched ones. The first one took longer while figuring out the best way to proceed. We found that pre-drilling the holes was extremely helpful and saved us a lot of effort and grief installing the rest of them. Each plate also needed foam rubber weather seals to be attached, also holding us up somewhat. Speed it up here to spare you the monotony of installing some 350 roofing screws. Day 7, Monday, and we finally had some help so that Nick and I could get on with different tasks. While I finished off the cladding above the door, Nick got on with installing the top trimming. The last trim had to be cut to length and sealed to prevent rust before being installed above the door. Next followed the dome ring. 
This ring carries the roller bearings on which the dome rotates and needs to be perfectly round and level for optimal performance. The different sections are bolted together with supplied bearing holders. This was somewhat tricky because the bolts are pushed in from below, which can misalign their holes. The dome ring then got measured for roundness, rotated for the correct orientation and shifted symmetrically on the building. The levels were checked and found to be perfect. Mounting holes could now be drilled, bolts installed and adding wedges to take up any gaps. After tightening the bolts, the levels were checked again. Day 8 was one of the windiest of all, restricting what could be done. Nonetheless, we managed good progress. Nick and I started by installing the rails on which the dome rotates. After installing the rollers, these were threaded in sections which were then bolted together. Since we were only two, we again had to improvise, but managed fine in the end. To install the dome skirt, we called in the troops again, and worked on the leeward side of the dome, which gave us enough protection to still work safely. Long planks were again employed, but later found to be superfluous, particularly as we started turning the dome. The last one was a little tricky to get in. Nick and myself tightened all the nuts finally. One thing about working on domes, it is so convenient to be able to turn the job. Another job that could be done in the shelter of the dome was to install the gear rack on which the dome will eventually be driven. The instructions was a little confusing and it took us a while to find the orientation marks, but we eventually figured it all out. Wooden spacer blocks helped to prevent the rack from getting pinched. Finally, in preparation for the next day's installation of the roof panels, we erected some scaffolding. Since it was our first time doing this, we had to figure out the color coding scheme first. Getting something wrong is unfortunately the way one learns. Ample cross bracing made it very sturdy and tying the two together even more. We could not install the platforms yet for fear of getting blown away by the wind. Yes, at this rate we almost reached the moon. The weather prospects for day 9 predicted perfect conditions for installing the roof panels. Calm conditions are mandatory since the structure is quite floppy initially. As it progresses, it stiffens up gradually and only become rigid once complete. This is quite a clever system with the panels sliding into each other and getting bolted down with two sets of fasteners at the bottom. Again, we were one person short which meant that I had to do the ladder dance again. Luckily the job can be turned again which helped a lot. Since the wind was expected to pick up gradually, we could even determine which is the best direction to turn the dome to prevent any possibility of damage. The instructions said to apply soap lubricant which we did in the beginning, but as the structure stiffened up we found that it became easier so the last couple of segments were done without lubrication which sped up progress a lot. Afterwards, Nick and I again tightened all the nuts, which is a two-person procedure with someone inside and another outside. A job that took up almost the entire day followed. This was installing the shutter tracks, cover strips and weather strips. Although the instructions said to pre-assemble the shutter track, it is then quite heavy and we were worried about getting it up safely. So we did it in sections and assembled on top where we had good access. This improvisation worked out well. The instruction booklet warns that the numbered and letters shim system is quite tricky, which turned out to be very true. So I'll rather skip all the boring footage which took up a big chunk of day 10. Access from the outside using a tall ladder was required to install a number of items, which can be quite scary. The weather seals were relatively easy to install after fighting with the shutter tracks and cover strips.
Next, the infrastructure for mounting the shutter motor was installed at the apex of the dome. Some Samson type pushing and shoving was required for this at times. Finally, the dome reinforcement structures were installed. and finished by the time the neighboring robotic dome started to open for the night, just before sunset. A historic moment on the final day, with Nick cutting the straps to the last two items on the sled, the dome shutters. First some scaffolding was erected outside the dome. The instruction said that two people outside must lift the shutter and hand it to one person inside. They were clearly talking about a smaller dome since this shutter was quite heavy and we decided to call in mechanical help. A skilled driver and a forklift turned out ideal to do the heavy lifting safely and in stages and has enough reach right to the top. Unfortunately my second camera got destroyed that morning when the dome door blew shut, meaning I only have footage from the outside. The guys on the inside had plenty of time to install the rollers which secure the shutter to the track while the forklift supported the weight. The shutter was then pushed open slowly to engage the gear rack which unfortunately did not want to mesh properly so was temporarily secured by a sling and G clamps to keep it from sliding down while the dropout was installed. The forklift was again very useful for installation of the dropout and to finally close the remaining gap under full control. Posing for a group picture of the shutter team was mandatory before dispersing. Thanks guys for a job well done.